Good morning, everyone, uh, and, and welcome to uh, this early morning session here um, in Charlotte at uh, French Historical Studies. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I'm Denise Davidson. I'll be chairing this session. Uh, this session is entitled French Studies and the Public Humanities, Teaching, Training, Doing. Um, I happen to be the director of a humanities center uh, where I teach at Georgia State University, uh, and so I'm very interested in hearing about um, the, uh, the uh, experiences and ideas of our three um, panelists. So I will be introducing our panelists one at a time in the order that they will be speaking, starting with Christine Adams. Uh, Christine Adams is professor of history at St. Mary's College of Maryland. She's the author of three books, among many other articles and edited collections and so on, and I happen to notice that her books were published in 2000, 2010, and 2020, um, which was <laughs> very nice and symmetrical. Uh, good job. And, um, and she's working on a book right now that is titled The Merveilleuse and Their Impact on the French Historical Imaginary, 1794 to 1799 and beyond. Christine. So thank you everyone for coming today. Um, so I know that the purpose of this panel is a broad discussion about French studies in the new domain of public humani or humanities. And certainly the essays I've written for various newspapers and online journals over the past 10 years are part of this trend. I am, after all, a French historian, and my work in French historian provides insight to the topics that I write about. But I also want to talk about the public humanities and how I try to make historical writing relevant to current events in a more general sense, and also as part of a call to arms for historians. The firehose nature of our daily intake of political news, I think, has made it difficult to remember what's going, what was going on last week, much less 10 years ago. So I took a look back at my earliest opinion pieces as I was preparing for this talk. I published my first non-academic opinion essay for the Rewire News Group, which was called RH Reality Check back then. I published it in 2012 against the backdrop of pending lawsuits over insurance coverage for birth control. This was two years before the, in my opinion at least, disastrous Hobby Lobby decision that allowed companies to opt out of the ACA mandate to cover birth control if business owners had a moral objection to a particular method. My essay, which had the title, When They Say It's Not About Birth Control, You Know It's About Birth Control, was a polemic arguing that the culture wars over reproductive rights have never been primarily about fetal personhood, the right to life, or religious freedom, that rather they've always been about control over women's bodies. It was also in 2012 that you may remember Missouri Senate candidate Todd Aiken made his mind-boggling claim that when they are the victims of legitimate rape, as he put it, a woman's body magically shuts down her ability to become pregnant, thus obviating the need for rape exemptions from strict abortion laws. Against the backdrop of the upcoming presidential elections, Republican lawmakers responded to the visceral outrage at Aiken's comments by claiming that voters, including women, were more interested in the real issues of the economy and jobs rather than the side issue of reproductive rights. So it was in this context that I published my first essay for the Baltimore Sun arguing that in fact for women reproductive rights are economic issues. So for both essays, I drew on my research into the long history of sexuality, reproductive rights, contraception, abortion, and the, 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 the desire to control female bodies, which is something I had studied in some depth while working on my second book on maternal societies in France. And this was also a topic which a beloved mentor of mine, the late Rachel Fuchs, educated us all about. And I got a real rush from the ability to join the conversation on a topic that matters to me deeply and about which I had some historical knowledge. So for several years then I have published opinion pieces sporadically and primarily for the Baltimore Sun and primarily on, on reproductive reproduction and sexuality. Um, I had been trained as a historian of gender, the family, and sexuality. And in most cases, the inspiration for my pieces was anger. I would read something and get upset, um, a Supreme Court decision, for example, and I'd see a connection to something that I was researching or that I'd worked on in the past or that had come up in class when I was teaching. And then I would then crank out a draft in about an hour. I'd be working out or something like that, and it would take form in my head, and I'd go home and write it out. Um, and I've actually found that for me, the most effective op-eds are ones that more or less write themselves, that, that it occurs to me and I, I just need to get it out. 
But then, <laughs> the, the election of 2016 had a huge impact on my relationship to the political, to my perspective as a historian, and actually to my own place in American society. Hillary Clinton's loss to Donald Trump led me to write America Hates Older Women, which to me was the primary lesson of the election. The classes that I had taught over the years in gender and family history were suddenly more relevant than I ever wanted them to be. And I wrote, as a history professor whose classes often deal with issues of gender, my students and I have studied the vilification of older women throughout history. While all women in all times have been the victims of misogyny, it's older women who have been the target of particular animus. Once they pass the age of fertility, women become invisible or worse. They're the ugly crones in fairy tales. They're the evil stepmothers. They're the witches who turn to the devil for sexual satisfaction because mortal men no longer desire them. Philip Wiley's 1942 generation of vipers portrayed older mothers in particular as life-sucking and coined the term momism. The vicious attacks on Ms. Clinton for her laugh, her grating voice, her dishonesty, her purported corruption, and her inability to inspire drew on the worst of this long legacy of trashing older women. So the, the piece really poured out in fury, and it was deeply personal to me. And I ended really on a note of despair. <clears throat> I said, I and other women my age understand what this really means. Despite the fact that Americans have said that they are ready for a woman in the White House, they are not. They do not want to see us, women who have the experience, the gravitas, and the scars to fill the most important roles in public life. And that is why so many older women have experienced this loss as a personal blow. This election has been the most painful reminder yet that society would rather women of a certain age remain invisible. Because when we dare to become visible, we are reviled. And that is a bleak realization. During, in, in 2020, then during Joe Biden's campaign for president, I followed up with a piece asking rather plaintively, when will the country be ready for a woman president? Um, so, so the political and the historical had really become personal in a very real way. Now, the election of 2016 had other consequences, and not just for women who suddenly realized that our country was more misogynistic, especially toward older women, than we had realized. Suddenly, the American public was profoundly interested in what historians had to say as they attempted to grapple with the historical parallels to the political chaos that we were facing. So it was against this backdrop that the Washington Post created a new section of the paper called Made by History in June of 2017. Its purpose was, in their words, to understand the history behind the breakneck news. The editors promise, promise that each day in this space, you'll find historical analyses to situate the events making headlines in their larger historical context. Sometimes that will mean explaining the origins of policy battles. Sometimes it will involve illuminating the social and cultural pathways that led our society to fracture in just this way. Other times, it will mean grappling with parallels between the past and present. While my previous opinion essays had always been informed by my historical research and teaching, here was the possibility to bring my expertise as a historian to bear in a much more explicit way. The first piece I wrote for Made by History in early 2018 grew out of the research that I was doing for a book with Tracy Adams on the, the creation of the French royal mistress. It seemed to me that the women surrounding Donald Trump, such as Hope Hicks, Kellyanne Conway, and even Ivanka, played a role similar to that of royal mistresses, such as Madame de Pompadour. Um, Melania, like, like French queens, maintained a separate household, more or less. <laughs> um, the Post editors gave it the name Why President Trump Resembles a Pre-Revolution French Monarch, which some of my colleagues found unfair to Louis XV. <laughs> so, the increasingly dire political situation that we faced in the second half of the Trump administration caused me, and, and a lot of other people I know, sleepless nights, but it also provided increasing fodder for editorials. The essays that I wrote for the Baltimore Sun focused increasingly on the French revolutions of 1789 and 1848. I wrote an essay explaining, um, in my head to some of my fox-watching relatives back home in Minnesota, um, what's wrong with the constitutional republic defense, and another in which I asked the question, is America headed towards a second revolution? Um, Nina Kushner and I co-wrote a piece for the History News Network in the wake of the first impeachment trial, harking back to the age of enlightenment and, and wondering whether, will, whether will history judge Trump, and concluded if only if we retain our capacity for judgment. So more and more, I found terrifying parallels to the present in France's political history. I actually wrote seven essays for Made by History between March of 2020, just as COVID was taking off, and May of 2021. 
I am undoubtedly neither the first nor the last historian to compare Trump to Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, a link I made in Coronavirus Exposes the True Cost of Republicans' Acquiescence to Trump, but it felt like there was new fodder for an essay that made a caustic historical comparison every week um, for a while there. So, so the nepotism that undergirded the Trump's administration was, sim or was strikingly similar to the patronage-based court of French kings, while the evidence that emerged in September of 2020 that Trump didn't really pay taxes reminded me of the revolutionary fury at the tax-exempt status of, of privileged groups in France. So the George Floyd protests made me wonder if we were facing a revolution of our own. A revolution of rising expectations dashed in the in the formulation of Alexis de Tocqueville. And then when Trump lost the election in November, I wondered if Republicans would try to blame the, or pin the blame on him for the chaos of our COVID years in the same way that the Thermidorians had made Robespierre the face of the terror. Um, actually, at the moment, I sort of wish they had. Um, my current research focuses on Parisian, Parisian society post Thermidor and under the directory, which suddenly seems relevant in all sorts of ways. So I was actually on sabbatical for the 2020-2021 the academic year, and that, that gave me some time to crank out opinion pieces on a regular basis. And I found it cathartic and, and really satisfying to think about historical events in a historical context. I think I was really aware of, of all of us as historical actors in a way that I'd always told my students we were, but I really felt very deeply at this particular moment. Um, it was in so many ways such a stressful year, and I just really got satisfaction in writing essays that let me engage in these public debates, and sometimes just to emit a primal scream. <laughs> I mean, that was historically grounded, of course. Um, and at times, publishing an op-ed has actually led to other opportunities to speak to non-academic audiences. Um, I spent the spring of 2021 at the Newberry Library in Chicago. Um, my first day working there was actually January 6th. Um, I, was, I was working away in my cubicle, blissfully unaware of what was happening back home in DC until I checked Twitter um, in the early afternoon and, and saw that the Capitol was under attack. Um, I found it increasingly difficult to, to concentrate as I was sort of following this off to one side. I was worrying about what the outcome of this attack would be. We live very close to, to downtown DC, actually. Um, and as I was thinking about it, the idea of another essay took shape in my mind, comparing the capital insurgents to the September of 1792. So I sent a pitch for it to Made by History late that afternoon, and they asked how fast I could turn it around. Um, and it appeared in the Washington Post the next morning, actually. <laughs> Um, after it ran, Keelan Burke, who's the director of fellowships and academic programs at the Newberry, asked if I was willing to do an interview for the Newberry's YouTube and Facebook channels, talking about various flashpoints in the French Revolution and the lessons we might draw for today. And I actually ended up doing another essay based on that talk for the online journal Age of Revolutions, which is also a great venue for, for short historical essays. Then last summer, I wrote another piece for the Baltimore Sun asking rhetorically um, why right-wing politicians are so worried about what professors teach in the classroom and, and actually wondering about whether they're going to start raising questions about how we teach the rise of fascism um, once they stop fulminating about critical race theory. Um, newsflash, they actually have started doing that in some states, saying that we need to provide a balanced view of the rise of the Nazis and fascists. Um, but after, after I published that, um, a member of the Baltimore Ethical Society asked me to give a talk to them about how current events inform my teaching. Um, and actually just this week I did an interview with Laura Coates um, who has a, a radio show on the POTUS channel on XM or Sirius XM um, and I was invited to appear to talk about a recent essay that I had written on economic sanctions and historical context which is not my area of expertise and that was sort of a, a challenge because they don't give you the questions in advance. But, but I mean more generally writing for non-academic audiences can lead to further opportunities to engage, which I think is really a good thing. So, so I'm really grateful for forums like the Washington Post Made by History, the Baltimore Sun's editorial page, um, the History News Network, and other venues that publish history-inflected pieces. Um, I know other colleagues in French history have written for the New York Times, um, for Slate, both Nina Kushner and more recently Megan Roberts have written for them. Um, the Atlantic sometimes publishes these essays, um, The New Republic. Um, Mita Chaudhary has written really compellingly about her personal experiences for The Guardian. And I'm always really happy to see historians writing for popular venues because, in, in my opinion at least, no one is better qualified than trained historians to step into the fray. 
And it does seem to me that the public, um, well, at least some members of the public, um, is more interested these days in hearing what historians have to say. Um, as we live through what many people, to what to many people seems to be an unprecedented historical moment, and when lessons from history suggest that a more authoritarian American future is perhaps more likely than a democratic one, I think historians have a lot to offer um, thinking this through. And on that note, I think French historians who have studied France's tumultuous political history have had quite a bit to say about this. Um, it's true, I think, that publications like the New York Times are more likely to turn to well-known scholars who are affiliated with elite institutions, so people like Timothy Snyder for, for insights to our grim political context, or, or Ruth ben who who writes about fascism creep. Um, in French history, David Bell writes regularly on politics and culture for the non-academic press, including French newspapers and journals. And these, these individuals have a very deep knowledge. They have a deft way with words that can shape public debate. Um, but I'm going to do some special pleading here for those of us at public institutions and especially small liberal arts colleges who navigate heavy teaching loads at the same time that we're trying to keep up with our more specialized scholarship. Um, I suspect I have many colleagues who, like me, are one of the few Europeanists at their college or university. As the one member of my department who specializes in West European history, I've taught classes ranging from medieval to the present um, in subjects that include gender, the family, politics, diplomatic history, Third Republic France, Hitler's Germany, British history, historiography, and autobiography and history, and more. Um, and I just sort of think that this has to provide me with a wider comparative context in which to consider my own more narrowly defined field of research. I remember a professor from graduate school who was one of the foremost scholars of medieval French history. He specialized in the history of northern France around the year 1200. And I know this because I once asked him a question about a political conflict in the Mediterranean in the 14th century, and he answered in no uncertain terms that he knew about northern France around the year 1200. <laughs> um, and he knew everything about, about that period and, and that place. But few of us at smaller places have that luxury um, or those blinders. And I would argue that our preparation for a, a wide range of classes gives us a broad perspective that provides a richness and a detailed comparative knowledge that is extraordinarily useful in writing for a wider public. And while I'm at it, allow me to directly confront a frequent criticism of academic authors that our prose is dense and hard to follow and that popular historians, um, that is writers who are not trained as historians such as journalists, do a better job of writing for a general audience. I completely reject that notion. Who is better than a teacher of undergraduates at synthesizing complex ideas for an audience that doesn't have a background in the topic and very possibly did not do the reading to prepare for class that day? Um, we know we have to construct a compelling narrative with the occasional fun anecdote to keep them engaged. Why would we be incapable of doing that in our own work? Um, I point you again here to Megan Roberts' piece on 18th century wife guys in Slate, or Sarah Horowitz's Made by History piece on why bad behavior gets a pass at elite institutions. Um, both are pieces that reflected the zeitgeist that drew on their historical experience and were really fun to read. And while we're sometimes, I think, it's true for us to flatten out the nuance that we might prefer to bring to our writing, at least we're less likely to make glaring errors in our work. Um, Naomi Wolf, for example. Um, so let's all get out there, those of us who can. Let's use our knowledge and let's use our training to intervene in current debates. It's satisfying. It's a public service. And essays for newspapers and popular journals can spread our work to a much wider readership. I want to end here, though, on a more sober note. I realize that even hailing from a small public college that is not very well known and that people regularly confuse with the Catholic University, Mount St. Mary's, um, I speak from a place of privilege in many ways. One is that I'm a full professor. And even though my workload seems to ratchet up on a daily basis, um, I can manage to carve out time to write the occasional editorial and stay on top of my other work. I have a paycheck which matters because the venues that I've written for so far do not pay. Um, as my editor at the Baltimore Sun says, we offer a platform but unfortunately not payment. So that might not seem like a productive use of time for a junior scholar who's scrambling to piece together jobs or who is working towards tenure. Furthermore, I work in a state where the political climate is much less frightening than it is in other states right now. And I understand that I have colleagues who may not want to risk the backlash that's associated with writing from a political perspective. Um, as we've seen in some cases, the consequences of that can be devastating. 
And I have noticed that even at my own school, while we are encouraged to engage with the wider community, the publicity folks are rather cautious about which pieces of mine they choose to link to the website. So finally, the, the current political context and the ever-growing rancor in political discourse do underline for me the importance of tenure for faculty as well as a commitment to academic freedom and freedom of speech. Those of us who have the institutional support to engage need to do so. And we need to continue to fight for the robust commitment to academic freedom that permits us to do so on our own behalf and on behalf of our colleagues. We need to continue to make the case to the public at large as we use our expertise to engage in debate that the protection tenure offers is not a sinecure for lazy professors, but it's rather a guarantee that radical state legislatures and conservative boards of trustees will not be able to keep the lessons of history from a public that, I hope, wants and certainly needs to hear them. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I forgot to mention, in addition to <clears throat> earlier, I mentioned that Christine published three books. I should have mentioned at least the title of one of them, uh, and I'll mention the most recent one, uh, <clears throat> which is The Creation of the French Royal Mistress from Agnès Sorel to Madame du Barry, which she co wrote with her sister, Tracy Adams, uh, and was published by Penn State Press in 2020. Okay, so to move on to our next presenter, um, Elizabeth Fink uh, is uh, currently editor of the journal French Politics, French Politics, Culture, and Society, uh, which comes out of the Institute of French Studies at NYU. She received her PhD in history from NYU. Um, in addition to um, <clears throat> a series of articles and book chapters, she's working on a book uh, currently right now, which is entitled Elections and Political Mobilization During Decolonization, Voting in Post-War French Africa. Please. Thank you so much for the introduction and thanks so much for that fascinating contribution, Chris. So today I'm here to kind of pivot to talking about public humanities and French studies in terms of teaching. Uh, and first, I give you a, a caveat. I give this talk with a great deal of humility. Uh, my goal is to elaborate the problem, to think through the challenges and also the possibilities of engaging in this sort of emerging pedagogical field and what it means for us in French history. All right, second caveat, which is I'm saying French history really broadly conceived. I'm a historian of decolonization in West Africa. So kind of throughout this presentation, think of French history in a pretty capacious way. So I have a lot fewer answers and even arguments than I might usually have in a conference presentation, but I hope to share my own work and my own thinking from the last few years, and above all, to invite discussion and to hear from others' experiences. I've started teaching a course called French Studies and Public Humanities, and I'll discuss uh, what I've done so far and how I've been thinking about it. And one final caveat, which is that I've only begun teaching um, in the pub and really wrestling with these questions about the public humanities in the context of the pandemic which brings up a great many challenges. So first and foremost, I was cut off pedagogically from the places I think that would have been most natural to go, especially teaching in New York City. But it's also, of course, had its silver linings. And I think it was really useful for me in helping to distill my own priorities and think more intensely, and at times, to be honest, desperately, <laughs> about methodology. And today I'll talk about the conundrum of reconciling this new field with French history, and then I'll lay out different ways I've, I've kind of charted to go forward. So first, the million dollar question. What are the public humanities? And on the one hand, it's sort of a discipline. On the other hand, a conference and publication buzzword. And at least in universities like mine, it's increasingly an oft-repeated buzzword in administrative circles. But above all, I found it notoriously difficult to define, even doing a deep dive on the subject. Public humanities as a term is vague enough to sort of encompass, but definitely not be coterminous with a field like public history. And there's a more flashy and I think easier to define offshoot digital humanities. And even realizing there are many more people doing work we might identify as belonging to the public humanities than there are people who claim the mantle. Defining it, I think, is still useful to understand the institutional lay of the land. Robin Schroeder, who's an American historian who worked in several public humanities programs, suggests helpfully, and I quote, you'll want to make like an undergraduate on a deadline and reference the Wikipedia page. 
the Wikipedia page was created by the MA students in the John Nichols Brown Center for Public Humanities and Cultural Heritage. A little digging on my part revealed that they did so in the course of their, in the uh, context of their coursework on assignment. The page defines public humanities as, I quote, the work of federal, state, nonprofit, and community-based cultural organizations that engage people in conversations, facilitate and present lectures, exhibitions, performances, and other programs for the general public on topics such as history, philosophy, popular culture, and the arts. Public humanities also exists within universities as a collaborative enterprise between communities and faculty, staff, and students. But Wikipedia, despite the students' best efforts, still leaves questions unanswered. Are public humanities defined, as Wikipedia would suggest, by the collaboration of groups within and outside the university exclusively? And I should also add, the meat of the Wikipedia page is a list of universities. They're pretty much all American, with the lone exception of the University of Sheffield in the UK, with public humanities programs, listed like a sort of biblical incantation of dissent. Wikipedia, in any case, shows us what I think is important to highlight here, which is the American institutional element. But I'll add a little bit more. The term public humanities arose in the last 50 years, around the time of the passage of the National Foundations for the Art and Humanities Act in 1965. This institutional origin story, from university programming to grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, helps point to what's distinctly American, institutionally, and I think in some ways more than institutionally, about the origin of the term and the zeitgeist. And of course, we have to understand the rise and in increasing popularity of the public humanities in terms of the perennial crises of the humanities. And in any case, the humanities being in a state of crisis resonates deeply in our worlds, in French history. I won't go into the history and hand-wringing around these crises, which you can hear about in more depth and which you already know about, but I have to point out a few contexts from the lack of public trust in the mission of the humanities, conflict around university governance, economic changes and the increase in inequality in American life, the growing dominance of STEM and the increased imperatives for humanities departments and faculties to show students the value of studying the humanities. And I'd give a particular nod to our colleagues in the UK who are wrestling with this in a direct um, kind of state-centered way with the REF system, and et cetera, et cetera. So, of course, I also want to foreground the crises of the academic job market, as Chris nodded to, and I think is essential here. Um, and it's especially essential for those of us who, as I am, are teaching graduate students, and certainly students enrolled in or thinking about enrolling in doctoral programs. Okay. So the last thing I'd want to highlight, which is that the term public humanities itself is difficult to translate into French, in part because the institutional landscape from which it sprung doesn't entirely translate. So the biggest question I want to ask today is how to reconcile this fairly American field with doing French history, with doing French studies, particularly given the fact that in a lot of ways it's more the natural province of uh, American studies, of people doing kind of local public history work uh, that's more locally grounded. And that was something I really figured out doing a deep dive into scholarly articles on teaching public humanities, is how dominated it is by disciplines that aren't ours, that aren't area studies, that aren't French history. And when I first started teaching this course, the option to say visit museums or galleries or community organizations or francophone immigrant networks were completely off the table. I couldn't even go to my office half a mile away. So it got me thinking, first of all, about the challenge of doing French studies uh, and how to handle it without, in some ways, the aids, but also the crutch of going into the community. So in my own class, here's what I settled on. Thinking theoretically about the idea of a public helped me get away from what seemed like a potential trap. That's to say that I was wary of doing a class that was too broadly uh, pre-professional in a way that I felt like I both didn't have enough expertise or real connections and worried about a class that didn't have enough of a, uh, a there there, right, academically. And I also wanted to engage students who envision themselves on a diverse array of paths. Some of my students are enrolled as doctoral students, some are MA students seeking to get doctorates, whereas others are thinking about other kinds of careers in K-12 teaching, government, and NGOs and anchoring the class with a theoretical basis by beginning with theoretical and historical sources on the nature of the public sphere in France and in French history, again, broadly conceived. 
seemed like a way to make sure there was theoretical and academic depth that connected our class conversation. How have cultural theorists and historians defined the public sphere from thinking about the 18th century? And I had a lot of fun beginning with Habermas with them and thinking theoretically about key arguments about 18th century France, which enabled students to connect to historical work they were already engaged in around the intellectual history of the French Revolution in a new way. And as we continued roughly chronologically, we asked questions like who's considered a public intellectual and what is being a public intellectual entail? And how are, how are these categories historically constituted? These are questions that have particular resonance for us in French history. Of course, from Flaubert and the Dreyfus Affair, and I found students really enjoyed reading Barrez and considering how he used the term intellectual as a slur against Zola and the Dreyfus arts, and through decolonization and beyond. And the framework provided me a sort of scaffolding for organizing this semester. I prioritized including recently published work in the field and what felt to me politically urgent work in the field, um, tailored to my own interests, and giving us opportunities for thinking broadly about how scholars and others communicate with different publics and how their ideas change when they do so. In addition to readings, the class examines digital tools, including maps, soundscapes, and archived exhibits. This semester, we spent a week reading sections of Achille Mbembe's report, which was commissioned by the French government uh, on the relationship and the historical relationship between France and Africa. And we discussed the phenomenon of academics accepting government commissions to write about the public uses of memory. This seems especially important now, given the recent reports by Benjamin Stora on the memory of the Algerian War, Vincent Duclair, on French culpability around the Rwandan genocide, and Felwin Sarr and Benedict Savoie's report on the restitution of African art held in European museums. In addition, the speakers who have joined us have been able to discuss through their trajectories and their professional experience how they communicate with different publics, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But another thing about teaching public humanities, um, and I think one of the things it's given me as a teacher is an acceptance of teaching without mastery. David Bell, in a 2016 article in 19th century French studies entitled Disciplinary Quandaries, noted, quote, our hesitation to reach out to other disciplinary perspectives often results from our reluctance to intervene in domains in which we are not experts. And I felt this really acutely when convening a public humanities class, and especially in inviting students to design final projects in fields with which I had really varying levels of ability or expertise. And here's looking at you, web, de web design. <laughs> I felt extremely edgy about it at first. Who am I to teach students using tools I don't know how to use, right? Uh, I scrambled with everybody else for several weeks to figure out Zoom. It's a very different feeling, pedagogically, than teaching, say, an undergraduate survey or convening a more standard history seminar. Instead, it's about mixing theory, speakers, and creative and politically important projects and letting students use their own skills. But I think to a large extent it's worked. I've emphasized in advising them, guiding them toward research sources and different kinds of models, and found so far that forcing myself through the discomfort has been pedagogically successful. So far I've had students do final projects that included websites, podcasts, designing a museum exhibition entirely virtually given the restrictions that were in place at the time, and writing a walking tour as part of a curriculum for adult English language learners. They were able to draw on skill sets from web design to curricular experience and identify publics and work to present their research in creative ways. I've also tried to think broadly about who does public humanities from within academic positions and outside of them. And I think this question takes on added moral valence when juxtaposed, as it must be, to the crisis of the academic job market. And on the one hand, our discipline is reckoning with the reality of training doctoral students who may not be headed for tenure track jobs. And coming from the fantastic panel at the Western Society for French History last year that Sarah was a part of, I was struck by the calls for naturalizing non-tenure track career paths, in part to fight against what can be seen as the stigma of those paths. And I remember this from graduate school too. There was a well-honed sense of the competitive difficulty of landing a tenure track job, of course. But there was not as much openness as there could be in thinking about the trajectory of students' lives and the wide variety of options 
after the PhD. Often I had a feeling there was a sort of binary, right? Either you landed a tenure track job or you were condemned to a sort of adjunct hell and poverty wages. And I found in my own pathway after my PhD, through short-term positions, you know, various degrees of precarity, that the world is a lot more complicated. And while I think the condemnations of adjuncting comes from a good place, of course we should all be talking about the rising inequality and the corporatization of university life. We should condemn the economic forces that create and marginalize an academic precariat. Yet, it's, and it's obvious that everyone has a stake in decrying the decrease in tenure track jobs. I totally agree with all those things. But when it turns into a sort of demonization of the condition of adjuncting, I think there's unintended consequences. On the one hand, it missed the power of organizing and of collective action, including labor organizing that's had a lot of success in dramatically changing the conditions of adjunct labor in New York in very recent years. Uh, I think Fordham's big adjunct contract was uh, a couple years ago, so two, three years ago. But it also missed a bigger and I think more important conversations that's not just structural but personal. And talking about people's trajectories, not in terms of a zero-sum game, but instead in terms of priorities and pathways opens up a lot. And it's in this spirit that I think the public humanities class has something to offer. I think I went into the endeavor ready uh, and excited to talk about the public part, right? to talk about what is the public sphere, to think historically about the ways we engage with publics. But I think the most unexpected thing I found was that it was a great way to talk about private lives too. In inviting speakers, I found it a great way to have a space, to have a legitimate space. Um, to talk about people's trajectories. And I'll note here that all the speakers I've had so far have been via Zoom, uh, which given my university restrictions has been kind of the only feasible way to do it, which is, as many others have noted, a major silver lining of pandemic life. The ease of inviting scholars who are further away, scholars who have disabilities. In one case, I had a speaker uh, who was about a month away from having a baby, right? Uh, these are people who would otherwise definitely not have been able to join my class. It would have been either too big an ass or simply not possible. And it's a huge boon to endeavors like these. I focused on asking speakers who've moved in and out uh, of humanities graduate work. Some, and if I, I hope you don't mind if I pick on you, Sarah, some had careers before they began their PhDs that informed their scholarly training, and others earned their PhDs and left academia for fields like politics, diversity consultancy, and more. And it's really important, I'm increasingly convinced, to make it not just acceptable, but normal, to talk about how our private lives affect who we are, what we do, and what we study. A speaker who talked about being a first-generation college graduate and what it meant for her to go to graduate school, I think resonated with a lot of my students. Uh, and I felt like it was a, an important conversation to have that we maybe don't have enough. Uh, another speaker who works in a position in government answered student questions about her work-life balance. Uh, other speakers talked about having families or caretaking responsibilities for loved ones and their experience carving out that balance and advice for others who wish to embark on similar paths. And it seems to me these conversations are key for the kinds of structural change we wish to evoke, right? To, to fuel protests, to fuel different kinds of changes at the university, but also useful personally for our students. So I want to make sure I don't go over time and I hope we can bring up some of these threads in the conversation. But in conclusion, I just wanted to reflect on what this field means, right? I think when I first started thinking about what it meant to teach in the public humanities, it was harder for me to get beyond the zeitgeist, beyond the kind of institutional element, and instead to think on the one hand of the challenges of what does it mean for us to have so many of our sources, so many of our resources, so many of the communities we study so far away from our physical campuses to do this kind of work, but also to think about the possibilities it opens up in the context of other critiques uh, and other contributions we can make in our teaching and university life writ large. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, our third speaker is Sarah Griswold. Sarah is Assistant Professor of History at Oklahoma State University. Uh, she also received her PhD from NYU, um, and she's had two recent, uh, or a few recent articles, among them is um, 
uh, a, an article published in 2018 in the Journal of the History of Collections called The Colonial Museum of Marseille, Empire and Object in the Porte de Lorient. And her uh, book manuscript uh, is entitled Resurrect the Past, France, Archaeology and Heritage in the Levant Mandate, 1918-1948. Sarah. Thank you. Um, so thanks to my fellow panelists. Um, it's uh, a real privilege to come after such wonderful papers, a little bit daunting too. Um, and thanks for um, those of you in the audience. Uh, so I um, came up with a title that's a question, which I think in some ways um, matches well with the questions that ran throughout my panelists panelist papers. Um, so this is the question I'm kind of assigning myself and I don't answer it. Like that's <laughs> one key takeaway. Um, what does conventional French public history look like in the U.S.? And that is going to involve quite a few definitions, which I'll give. Um, I first want to sketch out a little bit of my background, which Liz just alluded to. Um, so I, after I got my BA, I went to England and did a um, one-year master's in museum studies um, and then I worked in museums or public history exhibition work for six years in London and in uh, Oklahoma, which is where I'm from, and then New York City. Um, while I was working in New York City at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, I uh, had the really great privilege to work um, as the assistant curator on an exhibit about Irene Nemirovsky and Vichy France. Um, and that for me, that was in 2008, that was sort of the catalyst to go back to get my PhD. Um, my work is on the history of heritage practices and museums. Um, and so it's been interesting for me to have this research focus, but then my current position is at Oklahoma State University, which has a 30-year-old public history program. And I think this is, you know, it's one of the reasons I was offered the job was that I had this background. Um, and so I work with our graduate students and our undergraduate students and my colleagues on public history training. Um, but also uh, public history conceptualization and theory. Um, and so that's going to kind of thread through my talk today, this, um, my research interest, but also um, how to practice conventional public history and how to teach and train. Um, I've become growingly interested, uh, as my co-panelists have, in how the public history field, especially when you have a French training, can um, insert itself and find space within the American context. And I say this, you know, specifically as someone who's living in Oklahoma, um, where the French historical landscape is maybe not as obvious as it would be on the East Coast. And I have not quite uh, threaded that needle. I'll be very honest about that. Um, so that's my background. My uh, kind of contributions, this is the way I'm going to frame my talk. Um, it's a first impressionistic overview of some recent salient examples of what I'm calling conventional French public history work. And specifically, it's going to be museum exhibits. Um, I'll explain kind of why I selected that. So this is um, my methodology it has a lot of, um, there's some caveats to it. And this is something I'm really hoping to talk about in the discussion because I see a gap um, by doing this research, not just in the practice, but also the, um, the knowledge of how do we know what French public history looks like um, in the United States? Why do we want to know? Um, so to a certain extent, my methodology is constrained by the fact that I was doing this alone um, without a deep basis in running a truly systematic study. Um, this is where I think, you know, if I um, had the time, which is another thread I want to talk about, um, I would love to work with a group on doing something like this because I think there's real benefit in knowing what's out there. Uh, so that's one caveat, is I was somewhat constrained by my own training and my own time. Um, but I developed certain parameters to try to contain, you know, my search. So I'm going to go briefly over them, and then I'm going to talk about goals and then what I found. 
Um, so some general remarks about my methodology. So first off, I did this on the internet. Um, so I didn't do any interviews, which is something I think would be um, really beneficial to, to reach out through um, you know, the history networks that we have to talk to people who are doing probably hidden kind of consultation on museum exhibits. Um, I didn't do any archival work. I tried to focus on history with the general maxim that I should look for projects that French historians might feel equipped either to lead on curating or to consult on in an expert capacity. I l ended up looking at a number of art exhibitions, as you might expect, um, which I personally would not feel qualified to curate. Um, but I included them in my sample because they were so numerous. Um, and I would also love to talk about that, you know, as a, as a group. Uh, thirdly, I restricted my sample to the past 10 years. And again, this is all in the United States. Um, so in terms of method, I um, looked at the AHR, the American Historical Reviews, reviews on museums. They started doing this, as far as I could tell, in 2018 and then in 2019. I looked on French historical studies um, to see if there was any kind of tradition of reviews of museums. Um, and I didn't find any, but that doesn't mean that they're not there. Um, I also looked at the past programs of the SFHS. I knew I was not there, but I knew in 2017 that Robert Zaretsky um, had given a plenary discussion about his public opinion writing. Um, I knew in 2019 that the last conference of SFHS in person was in Indianapolis with a focus on doing history differently, history and its publics. And so I tried tried to comb through the program to see if there were any kind of obvious um, conference panels. My main method, though, was reviewing the French Cultural Services website, and this is the you know, put out by the French Embassy. Um, they run a, um, a kind of compendium of all the exhibitions that they choose to uh, promote on their website um, or to cover. And so I'll talk about how that was kind of um, you know, a help, but also there's limitations to using the French Cultural Services as, as a primary source. And then I drew off my own personal experience working in the field. So with that, those kind of caveats, that there's a lot of really, I think, interesting gaps there in the methodology to dig into that I'm hoping we can talk about in discussion. So what's my goal for today? So um, one, I'm sure that something like this has been done before at a conference that I couldn't recall. Um, if there'd ever been you know, somebody who said, I'm gonna give you a lay of the land of what conventional US public history um, about French topics looks like. Um, as I mentioned earlier about myself, I have a background in museum work before I started in academia. Um, this is something I would love to do more of. I miss it to a certain extent working in the museum. Um, I find as a junior academic historian on a tenure track position at an R1 institution in Oklahoma, it's been hard to figure out how to get involved. Um, to find time to engage in public work where I'm really bringing my content expertise to bear. Um, it has ambiguous application to tenure in my department, even with a really robust traditional public history program. We do not have clear um, uh, reappointment and promotion guidelines on how public history translates to our tenure track lines. Um, I think that's probably the case at other institutions. So this is something that Chris kind of mentioned. You know, one thing I find fascinating is that I think in some ways the public um, engagement falls to senior historians, and that is an institutional issue that is both um, independent or individual to the institutions we teach at, but also to the field. Um, more broadly, for our field, it seems to me there'd be benefits to doing some preliminary research on this to nurture dialogue about public history um, within the United States with a French history um, content. This seems of interest to academic historians desirous to have more of an impact in the public sphere, but unsure about process, opportunities, um, how to go about it. It also seems of interest to graduate students, people interested in graduate study, those of us who work with undergraduate and graduate students. And I'm thinking about the recent career diversity initiatives by the AHA, the round table that Jen Jennifer Sessions organized for the WS WSFH last fall um, about French history beyond the professorate. 
and um, just more of a, a general dialogue of what our field specific societies can do to open up and probe our knowledge of work opportunities out there beyond the ivory tower. Um, one other goal. I wanted to get, try to get a general sense of what the American public is seeing of French history in museums. So if you are someone who does not have an expert background, but you are interested, what is the reflection of French history that you see in exhibits? So that's kind of my big <laughs> over, um, overarching goals. So a couple of um, questions about definitions that I want to offer and then um, I will get into what I actually found and if I you know, run short on time that can come out in the discussion. So point one, what is public history? Um, so I want to give a definition that the National Council for Public History offers. So the National Council for Public History uh, cites public history is the many and diverse ways in which history is put to work in the world. History that is applied to real world issues and pursued by professionals who share an interest and commitment to making public history relevant in the public sphere. They define public historians as museum professionals, government historians, archivists, oral historians, cultural resource managers, curators, film media producers, historical interpreters, preservationists, policy advisors, local historians, and community activists. So it's a fairly capacious definition. Um, yet there, it still tends to rely on the main um, uh, responsibility or the main remit of work of conveying historical knowledge um, in often a dialogic um, way with the public. Okay, so the other um, kind of key points that I want to make is how is public history different from ac academy-based history? And here I think this would be something really interesting for us to discuss, but I want to um, first give you an, a sense of how the National Council for Public History defines the difference, because I think, um, you know, we, we might have our own views, but it's, it's also interesting to see kind of what the field-specific um, institutional view is. So the National Council for Public History says, unlike many historians in the academy, public historians routinely engage in collaborative practice with community members, stakeholders, and colleagues. Collaborative practice is defined as joint historical work with non-academic partners, a defining characteristic of public history that sets it apart from most academic history. Um, so I, I'll kind of put this to the side, but I'd love to discuss that more. Um, the Inclusive Historians Handbook, which is a, an online resource that I find really useful, and I don't know if um, it's as well known as I think it could be. Um, the Inclusive Historians Handbook was created and co-sponsored by the American Association for State and Local History and the National Council on Public History. Um, it's a reference source, it's a living document with individual entries. Um, some of them are, you know, inclusivity, diversity, collaboration of practice um, and just to kind of echo some of their work which is in line with the National Council for Public History um, quote public historians welcome collaboration with the public quote all collaborators must be fully vested in the project and willing to listen and learn from one another Quote, throughout the course of the project, all involved need to remain in touch with one another and discuss what, if any, changes might be necessary to research design, timeline, or other project matters. This is deliberative and ongoing methodology, um, in part what is termed reflective practice and a shared authority, which I'd also love to talk about because I think for those of us trained in kind of traditional um, history programs, that idea of shared authority comes with a certain amount of um, ambiguity, hesitation, anxiety. Okay, so getting to my actual kind of core remarks, what is conventional public history? So there's several different theories of public history that you'll find if you start to look on the public historian, which is the main flagship journal for the field. So the big tent theory of public history is the many diverse ways in which history is put to work in the world. That could be working as a journalist or a lawyer or a state department consular officer or a teacher. Um, in some ways, I think this is tax well with what Liz is talking about with public humanities of how she's um, conceptualizing and training students to use historical content and uh, ways of understanding the past 
in multiple types of professions. Um, the smaller tent theory is that public history comprises an ever-expanding number of forums in which historical knowledge is shared. Classic museum exhibitions, oral history series, blogs, digital sites, roadside markers, tours, or historic homes. So the definition I'm going to talk about and that I use was this sort of smaller tent theory in the first initial research that I did. Um, conventional public history I'm defining as within the smaller tent theory, the classic museum exhibition to use the public historian's own term. And so I did that because I know museums best, um, because I know that that is often one of the key ways that American publics go about uh, encountering French history. Um, and then I also know that it is just from working with graduate students that museums are often kind of um, in some ways, you know, it's exciting and it might be the default option of how to do public history is, okay, well, I will work in a museum. So um, let me check my time. Denise, I have about 10 minutes or five minutes. Uh, like five. five, okay, great. So what did I find? So I looked at the French Cultural Services website. They, as I mentioned, they um, run, um, uh, they have a log of all of the exhibitions that they've done some sort of coverage on. So there were hundreds. Um, I drilled down to about 100 that were within the past 10 years. And then I selected 50 to look more closely at. And then within that 50 subset, I looked at about 10 really closely online. Um, of those, I'm going to profile a few, um, and then I'm happy to kind of offer some broad generalizations. So one that I found really interesting was Napoleon, Power and Splendor at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond, Virginia, which ran in 2013. It was organized by the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts with the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. Promo language. Step inside the private world of Napoleon Bonaparte for an intimate encounter with the propaganda machine that modernized and legitimized his reign as self-titled emperor in the wake of the French Revolution. Discover the exquisite works of art that crafted Napoleon's image and the imperial household that supported his audacious rise to power. It included 200 works of art, masterpieces of paintings, decorative art, sculptures, engravings from French museums. I saw a similar exhibit like this, but I think organized by a different company at the Oklahoma City Museum of Art in 2007 that also presented Napoleon as one of history's pivotal figures um, focused on much of the art collections and the art representations. A second exhibit that caught my eye, Silk and Steel, French Fashion Women in World War I at the World War I Museum in Kansas City in 2021. Another, the American Revolution, a world war. This was in June 2018 to July 2019 at the National Museum of American History in DC. Um, this was an American history exhibit, but had um, a French section um, and then had several public programs bringing in leading historians. Uh, two more, and then I'm going to do takeaways. Uh, Les Amis de Place Blanche at the um, International Center for Photography in New York City. This was a photography exhibit um, of a famous um, photographer, Christer Strumholm's documentation of the transgender um, ladies of the night in Paris in the 1960s. And then finally, there was a photography exhibit that was touring that was called Au Cœur de Mai 68. Um, as you'd expect in 2018. Um, it was at the Scripps Clark Humanities Museum in Phoenix and then at the University of Chicago as well as various venues around the country. So some key takeaways for right now. Number one, the French Cultural Service is not the best place to only draw your data from. Um, these are elite uh, approaches to exhibition development um, with very little of the uh, collaborative practice that the National Council for Public Humanities uh, cites as a defining definition. Um, the work tends not to be organized by historians, by and large, as far as I could tell. They tended to be organized by companies, art museums, or art curators. Um, highly conventional themes were um, the kind of other key takeaway that I took from what the French Cultural Service was profiling. That said, it is one starting mirror. It does begin to tell us certain things, some of them. It appears that American publics in large cities around the country are both receiving and desiring a certain view of France. Uh, art, design, and fashion 
Paris, war, monarchy in the old regime, and famous figures. And I'm happy to kind of unpack this more. Uh, there's also cause for enthusiasm. Um, those are all very viable topics um, with you know, wonderful historians working on them. There's a, a wider geographic reach than I expected. Um, there's also diversity reflected in some ways, particularly plenty of exhibits about women and gender. Questions going forward. How to better capture the more local and community-based conventional public history work that French historians in the U.S. are undoubtedly doing. So I was thinking here of the work with Haitian communities that I am sure is happening in New York, in Florida, um, at Duke. How to find opportunities ourselves um, to work in the field, as especially when we're not yet tenured, um, and how to train our graduate students um, better. These are questions, oops, questions that I would really love to discuss um, amongst our, our panel, amongst the audience, and I will stop there. I'm sure I'm out of time. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, So before uh, going to see if our audience members have any questions for us, I thought I'd w start by asking if any of you have questions for each other. Hmm. I had a, if I could start a quick question for you. Okay. If that's sure. okay. Sure. And I was thinking about something I, I talked a little bit about, like how do you make that leap into doing something that is not, I mean, I definitely understood your argument about the ways your um, your interventions really draw from your training, but right. it's not a mode we're explicitly trained to do. No, it's not. So, and I, and I loved hearing the kind of personal trajectory of right. how the political became personal, but still there had to be a leap to do an intervention in a new kind yeah. of way. And I was wondering if you could speak m more kind of not just about the kind of like emotional, political, personal, but what right. made you throw yourself in, so to speak. You know, I'm trying to transport myself back to, to 2012. You know, I think in part it was that I had gotten to a point in my career that, that you know, my second book was out, I was a full professor, and I was looking for something sort of new to do in a sense. And once again, teaching at a small liberal arts college, I teach a pretty wide range of classes, and so, so I, I step outside of French history writ small quite a bit. Yeah. And I think, too, that I, thinking back once again to 2011, 2012, I think I was becoming much more worried about politics. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I have things to say about this, and I read things and hear things that other people are saying that are no more intelligent or more, no more interesting than the stuff that my friends and I sit and talk about at coffee. And I thought, I have things to say about this. And then the problem is, first of all, sort of condensing what you want to say for an audience that is not an academic audience. Because we're it's true that we're used to writing in a certain mode, although I do think it's not that difficult to make the transition. As I was saying, I think we are pretty used to making our work comprehensible to, a, to an audience that is not a specialist audience. And so I, I, I wrote the piece for, um, I wrote the piece for Rewire and I sent it to our publicity people at, at the school at, at St. Mary's. And Lee Cristo, who is our publicity person, placed it with, with the Rewire group. Mm -hmm. And the second piece they placed with the Baltimore Sun too. And after that, I got to know the editor and so I could send things to her. And the same thing happened with Made by History. When that, when that opened, I thought, I think I could do that. And, and then I got to know one of the editors there and so I just send stuff to her directly. And so it's, it's a sort of, <laughs> I, I, I think it was more a process than a sort of um, aha moment in a sense. But I do think that, I, I mean, I see among my colleagues more interest in doing this kind of thing because some have reached out to me and asked about, about it. And I, the trouble is, you know, what I do is on a very sort of local and low level in a sense. There are, I, I do think that if you're at a big university, it's a lot easier to get attention um, and to, to sort of break into to bigger, um, into a bigger, a bigger audience in a sense. But I'm okay with that. I mean, I, I you know, I do what I do and I have fun doing it and it's, it's um, but it's a challenge, I think, even 
to get somebody to read your stuff. And, and I'll say that there's one more thing that does sort of give me pause occasionally. Like I said, I, I, I don't get paid for anything I write. And I don't care so much for myself. I have a, a job and I feel like it's part of my, my output. It's part of my scholarly productivity. I don't know if it shoves out people who do want to write for a living the fact that so many of us are willing to write basically for no compensation. And that bothers me sometimes, that, that it, may, um, it may crowd out people who, who would like to do this for a living because I think that it's something that, that probably should be compensated. So. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? Um, because I'm really struck by the contrast between your intervention as an individual and your finding about museums that most of the exhibits you see, I mean, presumably they were planned by individuals, but they don't come sponsored by mm -hmm. individuals. Um, and then your discussion, Liz, and um, this is Jean Pedersen, I'm so happy to see you in person oh, after so working happy. with you yeah. months on that special issue that Christine also had an essay in. Um, talking about the public intellectual, I would love to hear all three of you say more about how you think an individual historian, regardless of their background, can break into other professional worlds, whether it be the world of journalism or the world of museum studies or the world of public debate, however we define that. Because I would say for myself, you know, I have been very satisfied to respond to invitations that have come to me mm -hmm. um, from an art museum, from a retirement home, from the opera. But as I think about how would I intentionally do this going forwards, how would I make this part of something that I produce instead of something that I respond to, I'd love to hear more about what you would each of the three of you say about how to be more proactive. Um, sure, I'll start off first because um, I've been working over the past couple of months at doing just that. Um, now, I mean, I do have this background with museum studies, so I'm able to contact local museums that I think I have an expertise that I can lend and I trot out my credentials, right? You know, I do say I have a master's in museum studies and I do think to a certain extent that is the spoken language, like a passport, that then they think, okay, well, you'll understand collection databases, which I don't necessarily, it's been 10 years, right? Um, but what I've done, you know, living in Oklahoma, but working on French history, is I surveyed the museums. I just went online to figure out which museums were in my local area um, because I, I did want to have an impact locally, right? I mean, one other choice is, do I want to reach out to a big museum out of state to try to put my name out there and give them my CV and tell them I'm interested either to work as um, you know, an, a lead exhibit they might be interested in or as just an academic advisor um, on kind of often big museums with big exhibits will have three academics that they consult with for during the planning. But anyway, I mean, that's what I did. I, I emailed, I looked at museums. There was, there's a Museum of um, Jewish Art and History in Tulsa. And that was the museum I felt like I could probably offer the most relevant expertise. And so I contacted the curator. I just cold emailed him and sent my CV and said, you know, I'd love to bring my students and I'd love to be involved. Um, and so right now we're in conversations. I'm not sure, you know, if it will go anywhere, but um, especially as a junior you know, ten assistant professor, I, I honestly probably shouldn't take on a major curatorial role. Um, but I thought, well, I'll plant the, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll create the connection now so that in five years, if they're doing an exhibit on France and the Shoah, they might come to me. Um, so that's one way, is just, you know, being proactive about reaching out, sending your email, uh, sending an email with your CV, 
Um, and I could do that. You know, the other museum I'm thinking about is the World War I Museum because it's in Kansas City, but it has a, a national profile. Um, and so just getting comfortable reaching out to their staff, assuming that their staff, that there's this di interdynamic relationship that they also want to know of, lo of historians who are within you know, a four hour drive, um, who might be able to serve uh, on an advisory committee one day. So that's one answer. Maybe I'll talk, kick it over. Thanks so much for the question, Jane, and good to finally <laughs> meet you in person after many, 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 many emails. So that was great. <laughs> <laughs> and early days of the pandemic, so yep. it was just like 2 a.m., I hope this is okay. <laughs> um, but uh, I think that's a really great question. I think, and I also I really liked, Chris, part of your answer of the, like, right, there is something that teaching undergrads does give us, yeah. you know? like. Yeah what did I know about the Habsburgs? And, you know, I threw myself into, you know, uh, teaching undergrad surveys on European history. And there's an element where you kind of have to throw yourself in and chart a way out without ever, in knowing full well in my head, I am never going to have total expertise on the Habsburgs. Right. right. Or semi-expertise. Right. But um, I think there's that. I think there's also something really interesting and I really liked about your answer of how to connect these different versions of ourselves yeah. and our the kind of stakes that underlie the kind of research we do. Yep. And I think from early on, this is more of a personal note, but I think early on for me in my doctorate, I just assumed there'd be kind of two separate sectors, you right. know, being involved in unions and different kinds of organizing yep. that would have no, like, there'd be no way to meet that. Yep. But I think it's really interesting to think about not just the things that fuel the questions that we're interested in, why we care about the history we do, but a way to try to cross those. Um, I think for me in terms of teaching public humanities, I think, on the one hand, it felt useful institutionally, um, and in part as a way to search of, you know, how do we do the kind of interdisciplinary teaching and kind of cross-listing in a way that didn't feel totally artificial. You know, how do we kind of create some of those bridges to other departments and other methods? So I think there was something really interesting to me there. I think the institutional dynamics at play, at least at my university, encouraged that. Like I felt like it was open to more opportunities for kind of cross-listing events and having funding to do that kind of stuff that I felt like I had a big incentive. And I think there's the other kind of underlying um, kind of stake to it was also showing other departments and other disciplines why French history is really relevant to them too. To, so I think it kind of goes both ways of like what we get, but also kind of, you know, in that kind of general atmosphere of how does French history fit into other worlds. I think the kinds of things Sarah is talking about in museums also works to some extent pedagogically. Um, so and I think these are questions that I've just kind of started to grapple with, but they, I feel like it's a way to kind of build what you want to build and do what you want to do. And in some ways, that's the utility of the vagueness. You know, if you ask somebody what is what is the discipline of history, we can answer succinctly, and you can't answer succinctly with the public humanities. There's something useful about that, because you can make it what you want it to be. So I don't have a background in museums. It's great to be able to pull in people who do, but I'm not going to organize a class around museums. But you can kind of do something with it. And I think the last thing I'd say is there's also something I've realized about working at an academic journal, that there can be something advantageous too about not being an expert. You know, there can be something really useful about being one step removed. I mean, first of all, it makes you good at knowing when you need to pull in somebody who is an expert. Mm -hmm. It's like, nope, I can't adjudicate this question. I need somebody else who can. But there's also something useful about being one step removed and being able to read what's too jargony, what's too inside baseball, right? By not being totally in the, in the in the the game of that field you can in some ways be better placed to give advice on how to make it more accessible to broader audiences whether those are scholarly or not scholarly so there's something i think that can also be useful about not being too um in your field of expertise at all times yeah. that's a great question gene thanks for for asking about that because intentionality is a really interesting thing to think about because I, I love seeing <laughs> seeing scholars who are younger than I am sort of charting out careers that do incorporate public humanities in a really intentional way in your career trajectory, right? My career was much more sort of conventional that I didn't think about these kinds of public issues when I was at graduate school or early in my career really until, you know, 
the last 10 years or so. And you guys are incorporating this very much into to your career paths and thinking about this in, in what you do. And I think that's really great. I think it's really useful. And I like the fact that you're doing it in a way that um, isn't just sort of desperately grasping at the humanities as a way to save us, or, or you know, public as a way to, to sort of save the humanities. But but I think really thinking about how this can be a really fruitful and useful thing for a public and for our students in, in all sorts of ways. Um, in writing and trying to sort of position yourself as a public intellectual, which is a little grandiose for what I do, but but that's a lot trickier. And because you do have to sort of, um, you can write stuff and you can put it out there, um, but nobody's going to necessarily pay attention to it is, is the problem. And sometimes this stuff catches on and sometimes it doesn't. I would say that social media is both a blessing and a curse in this stuff because it does give you a way to publicize stuff, although it gets to be a bit of a grind sort of shilling for yourself in that way. Um, but it, it gets your stuff out there and people can see it and pass it around and it does get attention. But there's also just so much noise out there too. There's so many people doing the same thing. And so depending on what it is you want to do and how you want to intervene, I guess we just have to sort of keep trying and you have to have a sort of thick skin because some people will be interested and some people will not. And certain things you write will pique interest that you never expected would and certain things that, that you thought would be of interest, um, nobody pays any attention to. Um, and, you know, I, I, I like what Liz was saying about you have to be comfortable sort of stepping outside your specific area of expertise and ready to talk because we do teach a pretty wide range of stuff and so we do know perhaps a lot more about these historical topics than say journalists who are completely comfortable expounding on them at great length with very little behind that. Um, <laughs> when I had this, this conversation on Wednesday with, with the Laura Co Coates show, which I knew nothing about before I got the, the sort of inquiry on Monday, it was about economic sanctions. And so there I was with somebody sort of shooting questions mm -hmm. at me about whether economic sanctions against Putin were going to work. <laughs> and, you know, hell if I know. Um, <laughs> but you sort of draw back on your sort of knowledge of, of how economic sanctions have been used in the past and what I've been taught in, in you know, world civ classes about the 1930s and, 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 you know, try to put those things together. And it's not always very comfortable, so. Yeah. I have the microphone back here for whoever has The next question. So. <laughs> I thank you all for this really wonderful panel. Um, Sarah, your comments on sort of collaborations with art museums. This is this is the, the classic conference comment question, but I saw the, um, the Le Modèle Noir at the Dorset years ago and was really, you know, angered actually by the lack of historical context there that I thought was really important for seeing these images. Um, so I think, yeah, can, asking ourselves how we as historians can speak to um, art, especially because that's how so many people in the U.S. are experiencing French culture in particular, feels like a really um, worthwhile path for us as historians. Um, but my question actually is a different direction. So I feel like through all of the, the talks today, there is an underlying theme maybe of, of political engagement. Um, but one route of public humanities we haven't really talked about is activism. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering sort of how you guys might see us as historians moving into sort of um, more overtly political or activist roles and how we might also kind of incorporate that practice perhaps as a form of public humanities. Um, I mean, op-eds might be one way of doing that, but yeah, just generally. Can you introduce yourself? Oh, sorry, of course, yes. I'm Danielle Bojan, um, and I'm also an NYU alum, but I uh, am now at University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, so I, I have a, you know, one answer that um, is something I haven't done yet, but it's something that I keep thinking about doing, and it's, it's definitely what I would consider more in the kind of realm of public policy um, activism. Uh, and it has to do with, you know, restitution and repatriation. Um, 
because my research is on the um, the archaeological kind of harvesting that went on in the after 1918 in in Syria and Lebanon, um, I'm really intrigued and have been following um, the politics of restitution, um, the conversations and the policies, discourses uh, since. Well, since 2000, but I think really in France with like Macron and the Benin bronzes. Um, now, you know, the question of what can I actually do about that question is um, is something that I grapple with. I mean, I think that would be, um, in terms of actual practice, it would be writing, you know, a public public op-eds to call attention to it. Um, what I've been trying to do instead has been to figure out, well, how can I, um, this is something that I know something about. So first off, you know, this is activism within my wheelhouse. Like, I am choosing this because I feel passionate about it, but I also, it's something that I know something about. Um, but also in terms of my space for opportunity. And in Oklahoma, one of the best ways to channel the same kind of activism is on um, within the American context of repatriation and restitution politics of Native American artifacts. Um, and so, you know, right now I haven't done anything about that, but my colleagues who are Americanists are working on that. You know, they're working with our, our local tribes um, in Oklahoma, um, kind of in the, um, you know, space between the museum and the tribes. Um, so we have like a Western Heritage Museum in Oklahoma City that has a lot of uh, Native American remains. And so I have colleagues and graduates of our program who are working on within, you know, NAGPRA. Um, so that's, you know, a starting answer. It, the answer is I haven't done anything yet, but I've been thinking about it. And what I find myself doing is figuring out, um, honestly, how can I channel my, my own expertise and my own passions, but within the American context? Um, because right now from Oklahoma, I think there's very limited, a uh, very limited use, honestly, or application to um, the repatriation and restitution politics um, in France. So that's kind of one starting answer. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Danielle, for, I think, a really great and urgent question. Yeah. And I would say, I think there's a lot of directions you could take the answer, and all of which are good. There's how we think about these questions personally, which I think are relevant things to talk about. And I think some of the things that, I think that Chris was talking about before, about the stuff that, and Sarah too, right, the stuff that doesn't fall within um, the kind of work that gets recognized as work in terms of getting a job or tenure or promotion or anything along those lines. I feel like some of the best things we can do is still talk about it, right? About why it matters and try to create those spaces. Um, I feel like pedagogically, it's something I'm attentive to asking about, to opening up spaces for at least people to talk about, right? I can't single-handedly control you know, the structure of the university and what gets recognized, but I think we can still, within the admittedly small spaces we have control over, we can still create space for those kinds of questions, for making sure people who are doing other kinds of, for lack of a better term, outputs, who are organizing within university politics, who are part of greater movements, right, even if it doesn't connect to their monograph or directly result in a publication, to create those kinds of spaces to talk about it and recognize it, I think is both legitimating, legitimizing to others who are thinking about those paths and asking those questions. So I think that's, there's an element of what we ourselves are organizing, but also what we ourselves can just amplify, which I think is also relevant. Um, and I think, so I think there's an element that's at that level of structural, and also I think for me personally, it's been important to just kind of continue that work just in terms of, you know, what kind of place do I want to have in the world? Um, I know it was really meaningful for me to be parts be part of union leadership in the, certainly in the years, I did that in grad school too, to be fair, but in the years after grad school, I felt like it gave me some kind of rooting, you know, as somebody who studies social movements, to just do some kind of work within it and do the, the kind of work that felt not within necessarily the wheelhouse of my historical training, but that needed to be done and that I could do it. You know, I've done organizing work that's useful and I felt helpful. So I'd say just to add to what Sarah was saying, there's I think the important things we can and should talk about, about what our training gives us, about you know the kinds of conversations we can weigh in on publicly. But I think it's also 
key to just think about the kind of work we can do more broadly too. That's there's got to be a space to talk about that, you know. Yeah. I, I, I just love hearing about the the organizing work that that Liz and Sarah have done because I've done nothing like that. I've been so worthless my entire life. But <laughs> um, but in terms of activism, it's it's you know sort of. Um, I've had to carefully sort of thread that needle to a certain extent because I clearly have fairly strong political views on things. In the classroom, that's a that's a trickier issue, mm -hmm. and we've always been. I mean, my administration at the school has never said anything about this, but but I've never wanted to make students who are conservative, for example, feel uncomfortable in the classroom or or unable to share their views. Um, I've always felt that it was really important to you know teach issues of gender and politics and you know there are there's a subset of students who will complain about that but that's important to talk about it's important to talk about in in the sort of public fora that I that I publish in too in recent years I mean I've found that in fact my writing and sort of thinking about some of these issues since 2016 in particular have made me much more conscious about the project of saving democracy mm -hmm. and you know looking to the past in a sort of more systematic way to to think about the fact that that representative government has more often failed than it has succeeded and so i do feel in the classroom that i have become more of an activist not necessarily pushing any political point of view except in support of of democratic institutions i taught for the first time in 2015, during the run-up to those presidential election or to the elections of 2016, for the first time, I taught a class on Hitler's Germany, mm -hmm. and you know, talking about um, you know how how Germany's democracy failed in the 1920s, and in my classes on the French Revolution, we sort of look at those problems, and especially under the Directory, which is the period that I'm studying right now, how. You know, the project of the directory was to try to figure out how to institute democratic institutions and why that didn't work out. And I feel that with students having that understanding and an understanding of how politicians misuse history too, that that sends them into the world better equipped to sort of think about the very complicated political landscape today. And so, so. So I feel like I've been become an activist in sort of in support of sort of thinking about democratic institutions in that way in the classroom and in what I write. Um, so. I'm a grad student at Johns Hopkins, although I'm about to defend my dissertation in two weeks, so. <laughs> um, so I've kind of, it's like part reflection, part question, but I keep thinking about um, something that's been touched on in a number of ways, and I think kind of gets at maybe the definition of public history. Um, but, you know, I think about if when we engage with the public, um, how are we kind of showing up and presenting ourselves? Are we showing up as content experts um, in a particular time and place? or as you know experts in a particular approach and ability to kind of synthesize complex ideas and you know how much room is there for each of those approaches I think for me and I have not you know done I would say much in the way of public humanities but I'm very interested in it um, but I'm particularly interested in you know can I can I, you know, present my research or, you know, my expertise as is without connecting it to anything in particular? Um, I think there's obviously there's like value in connecting it. Um, but, you know, if you want to say, hey, I just, I want to talk about what I work on and, and kind of let it stand on its own. Like, is there room for that? Um, and I think sometimes about STEM and science communication and how oftentimes like science is just presented as, you know, here's what's going on in the world of research. And, you know, it's maybe not at all directly connected with everyday life, but, you know, people, it's assumed that people are inherently interested in it and all we need to do is communicate it. And I feel like there's a lot of pressure um, in the humanities and in history to kind of like, oh, we need to make it relevant. We need to, you know, shape it and kind of you know forget about maybe the specific topic we're working on and we need to kind of change what we do um, to show how it's relevant um, so I don't know I'm just I'm wondering how much room you think there is for um, you know presenting our research kind of as is to the public 
um, and kind of maybe what that means about how the public might see historians and what it is we're actually doing. Um, so it's kind of... Yeah, it depends on context, doesn't it? It depends on the audience that you're, you're speaking to. And I think that, that undoubtedly there are people interested in you know the cool the cool information about about your dissertation or about the, the stuff that we worked on for our for our research totally devoid of any relevance um, except to the extent that everything is relevant in some way um, but it just once again depends on on context right it depends on can you find people who are interested in hearing about that and you're right I think there is a real push to make our work relevant and so we sort of start there, right? We start there in, in survey classes, for example, when you have a bunch of students who may never take another history class, you want to convince them that this is relevant to what you're going to do otherwise in the world. By the time you get into upper division classes, you have students who are just really interested in, in the Thirty Years' War because it's sort of cool to watch them moving across Europe. And so, so it really... I think, I think, yeah, it depends on context to a large extent. I think that there is... It's harder to find the space for that, perhaps. I'd say I think it also varies a lot o across what we do, and I don't mean that in like a like a total like not to answer your question way, but I'd say it's it's, it's really different in you know looking at the history of World War II, right? A history that everybody thinks they know, they may not know it, but they think they know it, versus talking to people about West Africa, a history that I think people don't think they know. And even, you see that in teaching, right? People, you know, the, the what's, every student wants to tell you what they think they know about the Nazis, but there's a lot more reticence about, you know, well, what are the, the, the big long durée arcs of West African history? It's a really different challenge, in other words, and it gives you different spaces for what to do with, you know, that gap. And I'd say also, I, I feel like it cuts both ways in history, right? Because on the one hand, there's this, as you say, there's this huge push to make everything relevant. But on the other hand, there's a, you know, the kind of, a certain kind of assumption by like early stage undergrads, right, that there's like one historical narrative you can uncover. So there's an element where you kind of need to go both ways. <laughs> like you need to say on the one hand, here's why the stories that we tell about the past matter, but of course, like what is history and that there's not, you know, one big, you know, master overarching narrative. So I, I think it, on the one hand, it's a challenge, but on the, other, on the other hand, it gives you a lot of freedom to pick the thing you want to argue against in some ways. And that's, I guess, always implicitly what you're doing. You're always going to be arguing against something. You know, your, your Hitler's Germany yep. class. Mm -hmm. They Probably very few students really came in knowing what a fascist was, besides yes. bad. Yep. <laughs> Just like, how many students come in knowing, you know, right. the Middle Ages is bad and the Enlightenment is good, you know? Yep, yep, a, yep, yep. So I the Renaissance like, saved humanity, yeah. So, so uh, these kinds of, the things you know you're going to work with, yep. to some extent, I think give you some margin of maneuver. Um, or at least that's how I see it. And there's, I think there's a real parallel with teaching and with engaging other kinds of publics. But kind of where your field is kind of sets the stage for the line you want to chart. Um. I want to say thank you to all the questions, by the way. I realize for the first two, I just kind of launched into an answer, but thank you so much. This has been such an enri enriching discussion. Um, I think I'll just add um, that I've realized, you know, as I um, chat with people who aren't academics about my work, that um, the, the kind of two poles that I end up circling around, uh, one is process. You know, they really, I, I find that, you know, we like to hear about the archives that we went to amongst historians, but I also find myself um, not necessarily ducking the answer, uh, you know, the question, like, what's your work about? Like, I will answer that, and I frame it in a way that is about stakes, because I think, you know, when I present, if you apply for a grant application or write your book proposal, you emphasize stakes, and so I emphasize the stakes. Like, why does my work matter? I mean, I think we all, we're, we're trained, we do need to explain what's relevant. It just, the relevance depends on who you're talking to. Um, but, I, but I talk about process a lot when people ask me, because I, I mean, I think that's, you know, one of the most inherently value, valuable parts of our work is um, we go into archives or we use sources and our methodology um, depends on, you know, how we're trained. Um, but I try to convey that when people ask me. I want, I mean, most of my, my undergrads understandably don't understand like how historians work. 
they, I think, you know, they're used to textbooks, and so they assume that, like, everything's already been research so in some ways like what's the point of my job then I explain you know well I go into archives and I might find sources you know the same kind of things you're trained as a graduate student of, of how historians work I try to convey that more and more um, and I find people are really interested I mean they're interested that I know French like that's not it's not a given when I talk to undergraduates or people in Tulsa that like because I'm a French historian I, I read French primary sources and go to France. So um, I just find myself translating often our methodology. Um, and people are really interested. I think that then inherently kind of reminds of our worth um, in the public. We probably have time for one more question. Maybe briefly, we have about five minutes. Uh, so if we have one more brief question, or we can kind of wrap up there, whatever you prefer. Um, do any of you have remaining things you'd really like to to get to? I have I have one thing I could say if you don't. Yeah. Um, so one thing I've been sitting here thinking about, and again I direct a humanities center, is interdisciplinarity. Um, and we've been using the we've been kind of using almost interchangeably public humanities and public history. Mm. Um, and obviously I think public humanities is explicitly interdisciplinary. Public history is maybe more implicitly interdisciplinary, right, because you were talking about art, so therefore mm -hmm. art history. Um, and, and then the other thing that you were talking about, I think it was Sarah who brought up the methodologies of public history as um, opportunities for collaboration as well. So I'm wondering maybe really quickly if you could think, if you could maybe comment on whether or not, and, and if so to what extent you found uh, interdisciplinary collaboration useful in your pursuit of public history slash public humanities? Um, yeah, I mean, in, in, so I'll, very briefly, in uh, Oklahoma State, one thing that we've been working on um, is partnering with um, a, a field you might not expect, um, civil engineering, because <laughs> we are, um, my colleagues especially, are taking the lead on preserving um, and doing you know research on the historically black segregated high school in Stillwater, which is where Oklahoma State is based. Um, that's something that public historians are trained in, like preservation theory and a certain extent preservation methods, but obviously we're not civil engineers. And so that's been really exciting um, for our department to kind of bridge with this um, campus, <laughs> this uh, building that's completely across campus and um, has all sorts of different kinds of funding streams. <laughs> um, and, and, and then of course, you know, we partner with visual studies and art as well. Um, but yeah, it's been really exciting. Um, public history is just one of these fields where I think there's a lot of um, room for growth within history departments um, beyond the College of Arts and Sciences. We, we're also working with like, hospitality, um, our hospitality school, to kind of try to figure out how we can help them and they can help us. And I would just say, quickly, I think that's one of the things that gives us a huge advantage doing, you know, French history. The, the connections we have with the Francophone world is that I think it's actually a lot easier to work with colleagues in social sciences. Um, and I don't mean to make a gross oversimplification, but there's just so many people doing more kinds of mixed method work and more kinds of qualitative work in France that I feel that um, a lot of those bridges are actually much easier. Right? It's much harder to speak to my colleagues on the same campus who are all they're doing is setting up models and crunching the numbers. I d just feel like there's very little we have to talk about. Even people who work on regions that I work on, whereas having those connections in France, having those connections in other, um, not just national and cultural contexts, but disciplinary contexts is really useful and really refreshing, at least for me. Yeah. <laughs> I. I those are both great. I, I, I don't have so much to add except to say that, that when you write for a broader audience, you sort of step outside being a historian as such and sort of think about how to, how to appeal to a wide range of, of audiences. And so, so you sort of take off the historian blinders to a certain extent and, and, and sort of think, think writ large. So. Right. 
move outside your comfort zone. Exactly. And so. that's what collaboration helps us. Well, do, yes, I absolutely. Think, right? It encourages yeah. us to right to develop a sense of confidence in our ability to do to, to right. move beyond our own narrow areas of expertise. And at a small college, we certainly learn from our colleagues in other disciplines. When you have a small department, you you create create contacts across campus and and learn from from your anthropology and sociology and economics and English and and, and art history colleagues. So. Okay. Great. All right, well, looking at the time, I think we're going to have to wrap up there. But thank you all for your questions. Thank you all for your wonderful presentations today. This thank really you. was a fabulous discussion. Um, and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs> thank you.